So, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing on how uh, our research with sensitive data. Um, so I, I actually work for the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health, um, and primarily uh, I'm not a researcher, um, but I sort of sit across both research and professional services in that I, I work for the NHS and work very closely around uh, using data uh, to uh, ensure that uh, our, our researchers who are doing work with medical data have uh, the appropriate environment in which to do that. Yeah, so at the University of Manchester, we're just about to, well, in the process of a new programme called Research Lifecycle, uh, programs are looking at refreshing our research IT assets. One of the uh, projects within that is looking at restricted data. So I was asked to sort of come in uh, with my colleague Rachel to, to look at really what our requirements are doing it. And at the University of Manchester, we, we do currently have some on premises resources for uh, restricted data, uh, one of which is the uh, Trustworthy Research Environment, which is based in FPMH, uh, and the other one is the Data Safe Haven, which is one of research IT. Uh, and uh, they have sort of their own sort of pluses and minuses and what we're trying to do is look at how we rationalise the data and <coughs> what we've learned across both of those approaches in order to create a more effective service. The challenges that we've had with the TRE is because it's kind of based in a particular uh, uh, centre within the school is that you know, we can't kind of sell it so uh, it, and it costs a lot of money to run so it's difficult for us to maintain uh, and then with the data they pay them as a, as a relatively new service uh, it's, you know, it, it's got some challenges in terms of how it then grows and extends the service as well. Uh, we, as the university, are looking at cloud first, and so you know, one of the obvious uh, questions is, is cloud an appropriate um, solution using sensitive and personal data? So certainly one of the main questions that we did have to answer. So first off, what do we mean by restricted data? What I don't mean, I don't mean personal identifiable information. Uh, also, in this case, don't mean the data that the university holds about us, about our salaries, about our performance, etc. That is all sense, kind of sensitive to us, and it is all PIS. It's also very uh, business as usual data. That's stuff that we, should, you know, we kind of protect within our usual systems. What we're talking about is things that need that little bit of extra protection because of the risk associated with it. And so that risk uh, in terms of GDPR terms means that they, they've kind of created this whole sort of set of special category of data, such as genetic information. So if, you know, if my genetic information got out, that might reveal that I have a, a particular condition, but it doesn't just affect me, it actually also potentially affects my family as well. So it becomes, you know, there is a sort of sensitivity around that. Uh, there's also obviously risk with things like uh, if you have data on refugees, for example, uh, and, and, and somebody might want to get, get access to that data for all the purposes. So this is information that goes kind of like beyond that sort of PII, sort of business as usual data. It can also be data that basically the data <coughs> is not universal, it could be uh, digital, the government. They like say that this is secret data, you must treat it as secret. It might not be secret, really, in any real meaningful way. But they choose to believe that it is, and therefore the contract that we hold with that company or with that organisation means that we have to deal with it as though it were secret, whether it is or not irrelevant. The definition as well is user sort of risk based, i.e., what's the risk of threat? So I'm talking about the risk of right, my cousin finding out that they maybe have a condition that they didn't know that they had, or a refugee maybe having their identity exposed, which might lead to them facing uh, some kind of threat uh, from people who don't like them. Those kinds of uh, challenges. And, uh, and within the University of Manchester itself, we have an SOP called Information and Governance People, which basically defines three categories of unrestricted, i.e., data that's just kind of open and you can do what you like with it, restricted, uh, that's more your PII, and then highly restricted, and that's this high risk data. As a project, what we said is we're only really interested in high risk data, we're not, and we're only really interested in research. So, what is research? So, research is much, you know, it's a very varied topic. Well, I think for the purposes, again, of this, you know, what we're saying is, is, is research on data. So, so we have what we hold data, and we have sets of common tools that we use for that. And so, you know, in terms of restricted data research, what we want to do? Well, we put a box around it, we call it security, and our job's done. So, you know, and that's basically what the DSH is, right? That, that's where the data safe haven, that's what the TRE is, the Trustworthy Research Environment. But basically, we take all these things, put them in a the box, and we say we all people can all go inside inside the outside of that box if we give them permission to do so. 
And if we want to move that to the cloud, then great, we just back at all the containers and push it open again, job's done. So you know, that's uh, not actually the end of that talk, but you know, it should be. Some of the key challenges are around you know, where are our trust zones to this data? This data is obviously to any changes. And so we need to be able to manage it as it does that. So we have data coming in. And so the first point that we need to be aware of is that when that data comes in, somebody could have done something malicious to that data. So that the, the, when we load it in or with a script on it could, could uh, lead to something that's been happening. So we know that we need to store that data somewhere. And that we also don't trust our researchers to pull out that read only app thing that we have. The research will do stuff and then we scratch data associated with that on their, on their drives. And then at the end of it, then we'll want to export something out. But we don't trust our researchers to export that thing out uh, because they could just take a copy of all the data and, and push it out and then we've got the law and all the rest of it. So what we want to do is to sort of have somebody else in a different trust zone actually verify that research output before it's released and then that output can be published. We don't currently have any easy way to automate that part of the process. It's still very much uh, the mark or human eyeball, uh, which is a bit of a problem because it's not scalable. But there are some ways we can think we're sort of thinking about, but it's not it's not um, as easy as we'd like. And then finally, we we'll close the project it means that we might not destroy the data associated with our project. Some of our contracts require us to do that. Or we're able to archive the scripts or the artifacts that come out of it as well. And again, then that gets put to a different trust zone. So that's going to help we sort of see this virtual research environment that we, that we have uh, sort of actually working. And so there are subtle differences between this and the normal PRE in terms of the way the levels of trust and the way that we, we, we manage those data flows. One of the key things is actually is, is really about data flows. We have <coughs> projects that collect data on a regular basis that is sensitive. And our data safe haven, one of the things that our data safe haven can't do is we can't, we can't kind of put a pipe in and it kind of continually receives data. Um, and some of the examples that we have is, you know, um, you know with people working in aerospace where they're collecting data from airports about uh, the ways that aircraft flow. Uh, we've got drug registry data that you know, contains information about uh, uh, people's uh, adverse events and so on with, you know, associated with particular uh, drugs. By uh, you've got things like geodata that's associated with records, but then actually that researcher has kind of collected, done their research, and they're saying, I want this data set, I want other people to use it. But I also want to kind of guarantee that the wrong people don't use it because it's potentially been identifiable. So we've got that challenge. And finally, you've got uh, GXP, or Good Clinical Practice, which is a set of guidance uh, around, particularly around uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies that are like to work with GXP. She's basically just a whole set of audit requirements. It's not really security as such. It's more, this, this is more sort of, you know, you, you sort of, you know, the security is theatre or ceremony aspect to it. Making sure that, you know, you have, you, that everybody's kind of, you know, black rods handing over your key and locking on the door type, type of security rather than actually being secure. But that, that if you, you need that, if you're going to kind of win up your contract with a pharma company. So, you know, you've got those kinds of challenges. So, that, that environment that we just had can't really easily cope with that. So we need to have an extra tier on to sort of allow us to see that data in those sort of devices or from a, a, a research nurse having data or a patient tapping on their phone. Uh, uh, we need to be able to store that. What is potentially that even higher risk data than the research data in terms of more identifiable or more at risk. And we need processes <coughs> to manage that and to link it to, to other data sources or to anonymize it and then to associate with that have multiple of these VREs that then other researchers can then access that data. So we need to be able to do that. As well as potentially export it to different parts of the time. So so this this bit um, I mean it looks very simple compared to the other bit but actually when you sort of look at the risk associated with each one of those it's sort of uh, jumped up because we don't have any easy way of um, that's not that it, it, it's difficult to, to, to sort of understand how do we make sure that this one, which is our most sensitive data, potentially exposed to the internet, is as safe as this stuff, which we can put around inside the nice VPN, inside the VPN, inside the VPN, uh, to make sure that nobody can get access to it. More requirements as well, so, so we went out and spoke to, again, we've had some workshops, because I'm listening to speak to users. But questions like, can I work from home? No. 
the, you know, this is one of the things you, you, we have to say, you know, that, that we have to recognise that there are limitations, if you're using sensitive data, there are limitations to physically where you can access it from. So, you know, we have to sort of put those kinds of limitations on. The most common request from our user community actually is, can I just have the text that I can put into my data management plan so I can produce the funder that we're not about to lose all my data? They're not interested in how we do it, they just want to know that they can put something convincing in. So if I could do one thing by Christmas time that would make my research community happy, it would probably be that. And then we do have, I think, another challenge, which is really the third party uh, organisations are increasingly over-classifying their data against the risk that they have. This is partly being driven by fear over GDPR, it's been partly that uh, driven by uh, news uh, scare stories, things like obviously Cambridge Analytica, uh, the Care Data Program that happened with, uh, with the Energy Digital, it means that they're kind of going, yes, we know this data is being identified and that you know it's, you, you can't actually tell them really what is isn't it, but we want you to treat it as though it were and therefore you must treat it with the absolute maximum level of security that you can put on it. But what we're saying is that's not really practical um, and also probably unnecessary because actually if I want access to that data there are probably easier ways for me to get it than trying to sort of hack the University of Manchester and plan the data. You need a way uh, also then of, of kind of responding to that which kind of, you know, we, we, we recognise their concerns and we respond to them but that we don't create a burden for ourselves that makes it impossible to do research. Really this then comes around managing data flows. So if we're receiving, say, a large portion of patient data from <coughs> digital, do we use that in the same form for the researcher? Or can we kind of do some further work to mask keep some of the information that the researchers don't need within that data set? So that perhaps what we can do then is the researchers can work in their normal research environment. So effectively, we're, we're kind of declassifying it. So you know, we're redacting information and then we're declassifying it so that we can just use it in a normal environment. So that we don't need to give them, the, we don't need to worry about the uh, uh, challenge of, of providing a secure environment for everybody using that data. And that's sort of recognizing, therefore, that you know, different parts of the process could have different levels of risk. If we combine some of our patient data with another data set, we might find we've increased the risk of attack, we've increased the risk of like, re identification, and therefore we need to uh, kind of recognise that that can also happen. And so it's about making sure that at all points that, that everything's appropriate to, to, to the level of, of, of risk for those requirements at that time. <coughs> yeah, I think that's really one of the things where the cloud actually does help. Because by, you know, through, through software defined architectures, we can be a lot more fluid and dynamic in how we present these the, 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 the solutions that we have. In terms of sort of like that, that, then that risk-based classification and recognizing that there are types of data that maybe you know, we want to make sure that it is one person in a room without a phone, without any recording devices, without you know any mechanism of getting anything out of that, versus somebody <coughs> perhaps in a secure office environment with 10 PhD students just kind of doing their PhD. On, on the identified medical data. There is you know, quite a big difference between that, but we need a way of defining what the difference is. Based on the questions that are sort of in our SOPs and also the work that's coming out of the Troy Institute, once we've kind of said, yes, this is highly restricted data from a university perspective, would disclosure pose a substantial threat to personal safety, health, or security of the data subjects, yes or no? Do likely attackers include sophisticated, well-resourced and determined threat actors, such as state actors? Um, so as we did a couple weeks ago about the ground, currently have a team that's dedicated to attacking uh, universities. Uh, they're going to be looking for these types of uh, I think why why is that protecting? If the answer to that is yes, then you know clearly that's where we then start to need to really sort of think about physical security, really locking things down, active monitoring of it, and putting a lot more money into it. Uh, more money than probably we can, we can afford centrally. Well, if it's not, then we know that what we're really looking for is yes, we're looking for a secure environment, but uh, the security in terms of process that wraps around it can be lighter. It doesn't have to be as, as, as full uh, as that. From a technical perspective, I'm kind of of the opinion there's actually very little difference between the two, um, and I'm happy to be told I'm wrong on that. I can't see the technical difference between the two. 
if you if you kind of you've got a secure environment and it's being kept patched and it's being kept it's inside a VPN and you're controlling who has access to the user accounts uh, and you match or you're managing your user accounts appropriately, I guess is what we'll come to later. Then actually, I don't think that from a technical perspective, there's a huge amount of difference between them. Really. Um, and so, so that flowchart is basically a very simplified version of what appears in the papers uh, referenced at the bottom here from from the Trojan Institute, and that's where they put this classification scheme to try and help us understand uh, this. What, what we mean by restricted data. The idea is to use is not to classify the data, but to classify the response to it, just the environment that we have to respond to our data. So tier zero, and I map this to, uh, to the universal classification system and also to risk and examples. But tier zero is unrestricted, so that's basically dead, it doesn't matter. Tier one is stuff like you've got a, you've got your research output that's intended for publication, but you don't want to publish it. You know, it's not published yet, so you really ideally you don't want someone to see it until it's been published. But if it comes, <coughs> tier two, that's where we start to say, well, there's more of a risk. Uh, so that might be commercial confidence data, where you can have to protect it, but it's not necessarily that secure. And it's when you get to tier three, that highly restricted space. This is where what we're able to do, I think, is to make that distinction between data that is secure because it is, say, special category data, but not necessarily at high risk of attack, versus data that is at high risk of attack. Examples that I've given are things like, I've said, anonymized, anonymized hospital data, politically sensitive data, personal data, but there's also a low risk of harm. Um, I've heard a lot of universities do work with uh, commercial entities like Rolls Royce, who you know, clearly have their uh, a desire to keep their IP very well protected, so we need to respect that. I think like refugee data. One of the other things we've done is start to map out threat actors and kind of everything from organised crime to uh, malicious uh, humans to errors by software people. Cloud obviously introduces some other elements to that because we don't employ the people who manage the cloud environment. We don't necessarily know exactly what's happening with regards to, say, the high devices that are running on VMs in terms of managing the uh, uh, barriers between uh, jobs that are running, virtual machines that are running. And actually, it's <coughs> AWS or Microsoft, it's all about the resellers. You know, and and you know, do we have a, a, a reseller who decides that, oh, we, we, we haven't paid our bill on time, so we're going to switch off all the jobs? You know, and those kinds of challenges that are coming. So threats are many and varied. I think actually probably one of our biggest threats, if I'm honest, is, is probably uh, our, uh, our own researchers. Um, researchers don't like the data that comes with security. The idea of security is it stops you doing something as easily as you would like, and, and researchers don't really like that. So, so this comes from uh, an Australian uh, presentation. But uh, no, no, it says that uh, yeah, researchers are honest but sloppy. You know, they don't have uh, the same level of knowledge around IT security that you know we would like them to have. Um, they are reliant on us providing for them, and they're often driven by convenience. They want to they want to get the job done. And that's the thing that we've got to really have at the heart of this is we have to find a way to make our help our researchers be safe without them feeling like we've kind of just put. 10 pages of forms in front of them. We start to like deploying that into the cloud. What's the, how do we manage this as a life cycle? Um, so, they probably think about technology so much as the process. We have to think about what are we doing with regards to development, what the scripts that we're using, how we're checking them, testing, audit, risk identification, and, and then the management of the vulnerability when we, when we identify them and how do we do that. Fortunately, this is a very active space in terms of the amount of guidance and help out there. And although it's kind of subtly different, but there's things that you've probably heard of, like SO27001, or there's a whole series of SO27 and X points, some of which you can deal with clouds specifically. Um, NHS Digital produce uh, their own uh, guidance. The Cyber Essentials, the Cyber Security Center also has supporting principles for working in the cloud, which you can sort of go through to check. Uh, the Supply Safe Framework, the UK Data Service. And then there's methods for looking at uh, where your vulnerabilities lie, like stride. Um, so that's looking for three things, that's very important for the rest of it. Um, non mediation like entity, probably not needed. Escalation of privileges, last one. 
Um, and CVSS is similarly a, a, a scoring system that you can use once you kind of identify what your what your uh, you can start to score them. So, so you can really start to get into the detail, as much detail as you want, of understanding where you sort of start to plot these things out. But the last one, the micro tap is a really good and uh, useful resource. Once you kind of identify the types of taps that you're kind of expecting, that will then give you the specifics of really of how those taps are <coughs> And obviously, you know, there are companies out there that will charge you ten thousand pounds under a penetration test. I think those things, like I said, ten thousand one can be valued, but they still don't underestimate the amount of responsibility you still hold to make sure you can find them. Just to touch on a couple of a little bit more detail, cyber essentials really, I mean, it's for everybody from you know the grandmother to your IT department really. This is kind of at a very sort of simple level. So you've got things like you know, you've got firewalls, your configurations, access control in place, you have malware protection in place, and patch management. And, and interesting obviously in cloud, some of that basically comes for free. So that's one of the benefits I think of, of thinking about where you're moving into the cloud environment. Um, it's not always free, but it's there and available. Um, so things like patch management, as like you mentioned, you know, if you if you kind of update one of your images, you know, you can kind of push that out to your existing machines or new machines. Quite quickly and easily, but that protects more reasons than you can with the state you've got on prem. But the, the, the Cyber Security Center offers these supporting principles for cloud, which goes a little bit more detail on the types of things to worry about. So, things like data and transit protection, how are you encrypting it, what, uh, 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 how are you doing that, um, how are you managing your resilience of your assets that you have, um, what are your boundaries between your users. So, giving access say, to a virtual research environment shouldn't just be down to PI and certainly should not be down to your help desk because uh, people in the help desk haven't been security cleared. So, what you need is to find a balancing act between that sort of public hospital and third class or service owners that manage it. Um, governance framework is important um, as well as having that personal security management. Uh, Personnel security. Some of this is a, these then questions actually for your cloud provider. What are your VMs encrypted? Secure development. So there are security on the lifecycle uh, type approaches that you can think about. Um, and similarly with researchers, one of the questions is you know, if they're buying a piece of code that they want to run, in, you know, they're bringing it in from outside, how do you uh, air gap that in? Supply chain security, so I mentioned one of the challenges around uh, you know, third, third party resellers. I think pretty much all of the providers also need to want to go to a third party reseller. But my experience with them, if I'm honest, is, is not great. Their target market is, is, is generally is normal businesses, so they don't understand research for start. And secondly, um, sometimes their knowledge of security can be a little bit questionable as well. Some of them are very good. Uh, security user management and identity and authentication are huge issues. At the moment, you, you can link to your AD, but to do that, you have to trust your AD. And while we have two factor authentication at the University of Manchester, I'm not really sure that I trust identity yet. We are working on it because I think these are the risks to cloud. Not like probably not necessarily the cloud provider, but the security providers probably our own. And so, in terms of things like identity, you know, can we use AD as a kind of as a seed, assuming that we sort of trust that you know, we kind of got, got to that point, we can then kind of take a copy of it and kind of use that to sort of then say, yes, these are the user accounts. But we still kind of need those processes to, 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 to how we then manage those user accounts <coughs> going forward. And ideally, that we don't want it to be separate. So the answer for our proof of context will be, they're completely separate uh, in the first instance. And then we will work towards bringing them together by working with our identity as we start to stand this up to the service. So key features that we've got to identify uh, that we want this service to have. Uh, the management platform will probably be on prem because we're potentially looking at multiple suppliers, what we're looking at is something that our user community can come and look at, get information about what services are available, and then Basically, we will we'll also have our research IT team able to sort of log onto this, kind of see what's happening, help them stand up environments, manage the scripts that they use to do 
do that and, and develop new space and so on. And that will then mean that what we have is these two different types of environments that I've talked about before. So we've got a basic virtual research environment, um, and the reason that we think that, so, so, so we kind of just dig so able to that's not proof of concept, but they're, they're quite limited as machines, they're pretty much just a single VM, so we can't offer our user community anything more sophisticated. The advantage of moving to the cloud is that we can kind of give them what they ever like. We we're thinking of doing some cloud because it doesn't require any upfront capital costs. So we don't have to put a huge amount of investment in right now. Where what we do know from, from the conversations that we've had uh, across colleagues in the university, from the TRE and from the FSA papers, we know we've probably got around about 20 or 30 projects that have been unique to this kind of environment over the last sort of three or four years. That's not huge numbers. Yeah, so, so putting a big amount of investment into capital infrastructure right now doesn't seem worthwhile. The cloud gives and it gives us that benefit. And so what we'll have is that is templates for how you stand up the VRE, and also templates for how you stand up those kind of service environments that you And then associated with that, and this is just a, a fraction of, of really the, the activity that we then got to do in order to effectively got to have sort of service so that our use community can, can access it. Because we need to link, we do need to connect into other parts of IT, maybe you can make sure that we've got all of these components covered. So we need the solutions that can help us to configure the environments and deploy them and test them. Uh, we need key management. So that's obviously a key encryption keys that we use for you know, encrypting our devices. Uh, we need API keys as well, you know, for, for services that might be used. You know, if we're if we're doing minimization services and we're kind of creating keys for particular data that we receive, we need a place to store that secure. So the key management because it's a lot more sophisticated, I think, than just just our, our, our basic sort of uh, certificates. Uh, the cloud providers do offer their own key management solutions for those, uh, and that's something that we'll be looking at. I don't think we do that in house at the moment, so we'll, we'll be providing that to uh, the cloud provider that we select for our future concepts. Yeah. I've touched on IBAM and user role management. <laughs> we can also think about the VM repo, so we've got virtual machine images, how we manage those, but also how do we make sure that if somebody's using R and they say they forgot to load in the, that, that dependency, how would they do that? Well, we need a kind of white list of repository of, of, of those uh, uh, um, software packages. Um, we've also maintained system health. Uh, as I mentioned, I think that, that's one of the real benefits of both cloud and security monitoring, vulnerability management, network configuration, um, and actually basics. You know, I, I think it's fairly standard stuff, but you've got you know, files and how to configure up the next. No public internet, except for when we can hear it. Out of encryption and and just the recovery. So, you know, that's, that's something that we, from a common perspective of this, should be relatively straightforward. It's one of the sort of platform things that we should be able to, to deliver that. Challenges uh, we have the usual cloud challenges uh, around supply management, cost management. We put them up a lot of services here. Um, our IT services department is probably not quite geared up for a, proper, a truly DevOps approach right now. But if we're really going to take advantage of the cloud, that's where we need to move to. So we need to recognise that there is training and processes that are going to need to change and adapt over the course of the footprint in, in the cloud, uh, especially for something as critical as this type of service. So initially, we'll probably, we, we will probably be identifying resources that are dedicated to this. Ingress of software, uh, as scripts talked about, uh, research problems and finance process integration. So one of the problems obviously that we have is that our researchers will uh, set us up, they want to copy and paste that line in. But when we give them the cost figure for it, and that's when we put that into their spreadsheet, it might go into version one, is it still in there by version 10, or has it been crossed out by the PI uh, by that point? And, and so we need to work with our research finance officers to make sure that it's in there. One of the potential benefits of going down this at the moment, I don't know whether research councils might change their minds on this later, but because this is a specialist resource, we, you know, it is chargeable, so we can write it in, and that will also depend, I think, uh, reinforced by it being delivered for a third party. And then the final challenge is making it easy to use, uh, and that's not an easy thing to do, but um, we, we have to have a system. Some of the comments that we have back from researchers is that they don't want to do, they just don't want to do research on a particular data sets because it is too hard 
to get the environment configured in the current systems that we have. And so sort of they're saying that they're not doing research that they could or should otherwise be doing at the level of quality that we would expect. So what we're aiming at the moment is probably REF level three, where what we really want to do is our research is aiming at level five. So uh, uh, we need to be able to support them in doing that. And, and finding that balance is, a, is, is, is part of the trick there. But the benefits are hopefully improved transparency of cost, which we hope will benefit our IT services and research IT colleagues. Um, because at the moment, for a researcher, as far as they're concerned, all of this is free. Yeah? Whereas if we can actually start to expose some of those costs and hopefully it help us make the business cases that we need to make around how we manage and sustain these services going forward. <coughs> we need, uh, it gives us more consistent controls, which is really important. So we have to slowly find a way to educate it. We make it easier for our user community to use it, but what we're also doing is hopefully defining the methods so that they're not trying to constantly find shortcuts. They're not trying to constantly work their way around it, which in the face of uh, large ICO fines is quite a benefit. But it's, it allows us hopefully to manage and understand how to have that better compliance and visibility of the risk associated with the risk that we're doing. And then also collaboration opportunities. Uh, yes, this is restricted data and, and yes, we need to control who has access to it. But at the moment, our data is safe haven. If we're doing some work with like the Swanton, we can't expose our solution very easily to them. Whereas if it's in the cloud, potentially, as long as we set out what the rules of that are, we could make it now that's not to say obviously we do share sort of bits of infrastructure and so on uh, generally, but I think that it's an area that researchers have mentioned that they would want to explore. And it's, it's a way of maybe of depoliticizing where some of the data sits or where some of the work sits as well. Yeah, so that's basically pretty much it. I don't know who said this, uh, but came back to the feedback on our project, which is uh, to say that the idea of this platform is that we have to do everything that we but we also have to do the other sexual stuff as well in a harder environment, in a, in a more difficult way. It's not easy stuff. But one of the things that cloud is really giving us the opportunity to test what we're doing now at a relatively low cost. And, and low cost also compared to some of our actual on prem solutions, both of which were quite expensive and are quite expensive to provide and develop. So it helps us to think about that versus the amount of research that we get.